I'm the only one getting applause before I start. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the organizer in particular, Meng Chuan, for uh, inviting me again to Singapore. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. It's always the same weather. Uh, so when I submitted my abstract and my title, I was way more ambitious than I'm going to be in this talk. Uh, it turns out a lot of people have been talking about the things that I intended to talk about. Um, so in particular, I thought I might, what I had intended to do is tell you a bit about spherical t-duality, but uh, Hisham covered that in his lectures. And I don't think I have much more to add other than to emphasize that, um, that I think this is a really important open problem. We have a lot of topological uh, indications that there might be such a symmetry. So just, just to recall, spherical t-duality is, is basically a t-duality where you replace the circle bundle by a, a three-sphere. So you talk about bundles of this type, and you can do a similar duality as you can do for, or at least topologically, for, uh, for these kind of bundles. Um, so in that case, you don't have a three flux, but you have a seven flux. And, uh, well, there is, exist dual bundles in that context, so just topologically. Um, now, but, but seven fluxes, of course, couple naturally to M5 brains, and if you wrap M5 brains over S3, you get M2 brains. So all the numerology seems to suggest there's, this may be uh, lifted to a symmetry of, of uh, M theory. Uh, and I would like to pose that as an important open problem that maybe students here want to work on. But I, again, I have nothing more to add to what Hisham said about it. So instead, I'll be talking about something more specific, which is uh, also related to higher structures in uh, quantum field theory. Um, I'll be talking specifically about um, what I would call uh, linear sigma models gauged with respect to a Lie algebraic symmetry rather than a Lie algebra symmetry. And I have, I had, we had good reasons to study these. Uh, in the end, my result will be rather negative, uh, but I, I'll try to end on a positive note as well. Actually, I'd hope to be able to present you some very uh, intricate new results, but we didn't actually finish the calculation. So uh, so the work I'll be talking about is joint work with uh, Stirat Klimchik and my students Mark Bugden and Carl Wright, who are both in the audience. They're both looking for postdoc positions, so if you have any available, then talk to them. Uh, so the, it's described in this paper mostly, but in their thesis you can find more details, and again, there's some more work in progress, which we hope to finish soon. Um, so as a review, uh, probably I should first say that I'm not doing t-duality uh, in any global sense. I'll just do things locally, both on the world sheet and the uh, target space. So all the global properties I'll swipe under the carpet. What I want to emphasize is just local considerations. Um, and I'd also probably give a more physics approach than, I, uh, than a mathematical approach. So while I'll be talking about Lie algebraids and connections on Lie algebraids, curvature, torsion, etc., I'll try to uh, not emphasize the mathematical structures so much, but just, just work with indices. Um, okay, so the starting point is a, a two-dimensional nonlinear sigma model. Um, so these are models which are prevalent both in physics and mathematics. So in general, they describe maps from a two-dimensional surface, which I'll refer to as the world sheet, sigma, to some n-dimensional manifold m, target, or space-time in the context of string theory. And uh, we impose additional structure, usually on the space-time, and regarding to, with regard to the additional structure, we need to add more terms to this sigma model, and, well, uh, depending on the extra structure we introduce, uh, these things are interesting for different points of view. So, in particular, uh, in this case, I've just added a metric on uh, my n-dimensional manifold. It's a Riemannian manifold, and I've introduced here an anti-symmetric two-tensor or a two-form. Uh, so this is the basic structure you find in the vacuum sector of, of any string theory. Um, but you could add some supersymmetry, and then you're typically talking about complex target spaces, or uh, you could make it topological, or you could add Poisson tensor, et cetera. So there's many different sigma models depending on the structure you put on target space, and they all are relevant for different purposes. So without the B field, the uh, equations of motion just describe harmonic maps from 
sigma to m. So you could use that sigma model to maybe count harmonic maps. Okay, so from a physics point of view, what we're interested in is symmetries. Um, so I'm gonna uh, assume that uh, this model is somehow symmetric with respect to a set of vector fields which form a Lie algebra. Let me just step back a bit. From a Lie algebra with structure constant C. <clears throat> so under this infinitesimal symmetries with respect to a vector field, the coordinates on the target transform uh, with, well, in the direction of these vector fields. So with some parameter epsilon, which in this case is still a constant. Um, so you've all this, done this calculation, I hope. Uh, if you calculate the variation of the action with respect to this transformation, uh, you'll find that the action varies, of course, due to the variation of the axis, but also due to the variation of the x dependence of g and b, and the terms you find nicely combine into the, in terms of Lie derivatives. So what you conclude is that this model is invariant under these transformations if, um, this is not the most general solution, but if uh, both g and b are invariant with respect to these vector fields, Lie derivative on these, on these uh, tensors, then this model is invariant. Um, okay, so let's assume that. So the next step a physicist would take is to make this invariance local, so to not take global epsilons, but to try to make a, cook up a model which is invariant under uh, variations where these epsilons are functions on the world sheet. So that's a process called gauging. Um, so in particular, we wanna uh, make this model invariant for epsilons, which are functions on the world sheet, and instead of the index A, I have them take values here in the Lie algebra. So the epsilon A's are just with respect to the basis of the Lie algebra. Okay, so in this case, that's very straightforward. This turns out we have to replace our ordinary derivatives by covariant derivatives, and the covariant derivatives are just given by, in terms of some gauge fields, uh, as follows. So the VAIs were the, uh, um, were the vector fields forming this, uh, this Lie algebra with uh, components in the direction I. Uh, and then, then we just, well, if, if we would naively take the variation with non-constant epsilon, we would pick up derivative terms in epsilon, so we need to cancel this to, vary, uh, to in order to choose an appropriate variation for the gauge fields, and the way it works is, uh, well, the variation of the coordinates stays the same, the variation of the gauge fields needs to be taken as a covariant derivative from epsilon, on epsilon. And I guess we've all seen these, uh, these formulas. Okay, so these gauge sigma models are very interesting in themselves, but for the, from the point of view of duality, I really want to use them to, um, as an intermediate step to go to a dual model which is completely equivalent to the original model. So in order to do that, I need to make sure that there's no new degrees of freedom in these gauge fields. Uh, or in other words, I wanna make sure that, that this model I can somehow gauge fix, uh, for instance, by putting A equal to zero, in which case it would just reduce to the original model. Um, now, putting A equals zero is not a gauge invariant uh, constraint, so that's not the way it works. You wanna do this in a gauge invariant way, so rather than putting A equal to zero, we wanna put the curvature equal to zero. So the curvature of this connection is defined in the usual way, just use the Yang-Mills uh, expression, um, and that transforms covariantly, transforms in the adjoint representation of your uh, Lie algebra. <clears throat> and you can add this term to the action by introducing an auxiliary field, x hat A, that transforms in the co-adjoint representation. And then you can look at a model where I just added this term, so this term by construction is also invariant, so this whole model is, still has this gauge symmetry. And now if I were to impose the equations of motion or in the path into, integrate out the auxiliary fields, I impose the constraint fa equals to zero. Um, Okay, so this is the standard way people are probably familiar with deriving the Boucher rules. I've, I mean, I've maybe taken a slightly simplified version of what's happening, but Mark, Martin is well. <laughs> okay, Lagrange multiplier, okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I thought you were gonna tell me something pretty much serious. Yeah, okay, so. <laughs> Lagrange multiplier. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, that's true. Um, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, Okay, so we need to solve this equation, fa equals to zero, um, and of course, in order to do that, we really need to know not just the infinitesimal symmetry, we need to know a global symmetry. So let me do this in a particular, uh, for a particular model, uh, and, well, we'll see what comes out. So let's take a particular manifold with a G action, let's take a Lie group G itself. So here's a particular, um, and I, now I've written it without coordinates, but this is the same model as I wrote down before, but without a B field. So let me just take this simple manifold, which is a group. It has, uh, well, it has two G actions, a left and a right G action. Um, and these are just the Mara Carton forms, so these I can express in terms of my, of my coordinates XA with respect to a basis for the, uh, for the one forms. Anyway, so, so this, this model where I take a particular bilinear form on, uh, this should be the Lie algebra, sorry, is clearly invariant on the left multiplication by elements of G, because they just cancel out here. Um, and if my bilinear form is actually a, a killing form, if it's also uh, invariant on the Lie adjoint action, then the right action of, uh, of H on G also gives an invariance of the action. So in general, this is not the right action for this uh, <coughs> too many actions in my sentences. The right action of G on, on itself is in general not an invariant, it's only invariant when this form is actually a killing form. Okay, so let's suppose it's a killing form, then we can just gauge this action, and the gauging is just what I wrote down before, is replacing the, the round differential by a covariant differential by introducing a gauge field, uh, a curve, corresponding curvature term with a Lagrange multiplier, x hat, and the global transformations of G, not just the infinitesimal transformation, but the global transformations are just as follows. So H A transforms as a gauge field, X hat transforms on the co-adjoint action. Um, okay, so then we can solve, and again, this, these are just local considerations, then we can solve for the equation of motion for X hat, which is, which is F equals zero, and the solution is just that uh, A is a pure gauge, um, and then we can solve, so put this back into the original action. Um, so I've chosen this particular form so that it all comes out nicely. So the covariant derivative for a uh, gauge field, uh, which is of this form, uh, really looks like the original maurer cartan form with GK instead of, uh, of G. Um, so if we then choose a particular uh, gauge, so we choose a particular, well, we can use the gauge where k equals one, then we just recover the ungaged model. Um, so this is a sim simple derivation that my gauged model here with this additional Lagrange multiplier is equivalent to the original model. Okay, so the uh, nice thing about this false construction is we can also do it differently. So instead of solving for the equation of motion for my Lagrange multiplier and then fixing a gauge, I can also do it in the opposite way. Uh, we can first solve for the equation of motion for A and then fix a gauge. And I'm not going to do that in detail for you, but what comes out is essentially the same model, but with a different metric. Uh, and the metric you find in this way is of, of the following form. Um, so the conclusion is um, that the original model is completely equivalent to this model, but for a different metric. And uh, so this includes the case that uh, my C's are zero, so the abelian case. So in that case, the dual metric is just one over the, uh, the inverse of the original metric, so that's the one over R to one over R abelian T-duality that Mathai talked about. But this is, in general, this is called non-abelian T-duality. It's, it contains a symmetric and an anti-symmetric part, so in general it contains a B field as well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So in the picture, what I've done here is I've started with an action with a certain symmetry uh, given by isometries, a set of vector fields closing into, the, into a Lie algebra which, uh, whose action gave invariance of G and B. Uh, I promoted this to a gauged sigma model by gauging the isometries. 
I've shown that uh, by introducing this extra term with the Lagrange multiplier, that I could integrate out the Lagrange multiplier and fix a gauge to go back to the original model, but I could also do it differently. I could integrate out A and fix a gauge to go to a dual model. Um, okay, so this is the original picture. Uh, if you, I mean, so I took a very simple example with just the group G, but you can also start with a, uh, say, a G bundle. So physicists call this in the presence of spectator fields. Uh, if you do this for just the abelian uh, case, then you find that, well, you find rules for the dual in terms of G and B, which are known as the Boucher rules. Um, and in the case of abelian T duality, you can analyze those globally as well, and you find the rules that Matha talked about earlier today. Um, so one important open problem is to do this globally for, in, in, the, uh, in the case of G bundles, for non-abelian T-duality. I think it's still an open problem and uh, I think it's very important. Uh, but again, I'm not, I don't have anything to say about this today, so I'll just do things locally. Um, okay. Um, so in, in some sense, when you do T-duality, you look at the topological rules, it doesn't seem that obvious why it's related to, a, to an isometry. I mean, of course, you need circles to have winding uh, and compact directions to have momentum modes, but you might think there might be situations where you have T-duality where, uh, where the circle action actually is not an isometry of your metric. So, um, so people actually looked at these cases, and that's why we got interested, because it's, it appeared that there exist ways of gauging a sigma model uh, with respect to a set of vector fields which don't form an isometry, and people started using it in the same way to derive T-dual models. Uh, so the exciting thing would be that potentially we have here a new kind of duality. Uh, we've been not discovering dualities, new dualities for the past uh, uh, well, they're all sort of, I mean, we have found new dualities, but they're all sort of variations of the dualities which are known. But, uh, so potentially that would be very interesting because dualities are very uh, powerful. Um, okay, so let me uh, talk a bit about that. So, um, so again, the existence of global symmetries, of the isometries is a very uh, uh, stringent requirement on my procedure here. Um, and the question is, can we do this with respect to an arbitrary set of vector fields which don't necessarily form an isometry? And it turns out that there exist generalizations of this gauge sigma model where you gauge with respect to uh, um, set of vector fields which don't form an isometry, and it has to do with Lie algebraic gauging. Um, so before I introduce Lie algebraic, let me just tell you what happens. So in that case, uh, I take a set of vector fields which, in general, don't form a Lie algebra, but close with a set of structure functions, so non-constant uh, Cs. And in that case, I can actually do a gauging where I don't necessarily have to have the right-hand sides to be zeros here. Um, so I don't know how many people know about Lie algebraids, but uh, just a, a one-minute introduction. Um, so a Lie algebraid is a vector bundle, say Q over my space M, um, which is uh, compatible with just the tangent bundle over M. So tangent bundles, its sections are vector fields, that's what I've been talking about so far. But you can generalize this to more arbitrary bundles over M, which are compatible in the sense that, well, that you have a, a map from Q to TM, um, so it's called the anchor map, as well as a bracket on Q, which is a Lie bracket, which is compatible with the bracket of vector fields here in the sense that if I take rho, so I should have the rho of this, rho of that on TM. So you have a Lie bracket on sections of uh, of this vector bundle, which is compatible with the Lie algebra of vector fields on TM. And, uh, you need also some analog of the Leibniz identity, but this is basically what a Lie algebra is. And a lot of the structures you have on TM, so you have Cartan relations, you have a differential, you have contraction, you have Lie derivatives, all of that generalizes to, uh, 
to uh, Catalan relations on sections of these bundles. So in, in some sense, they're very natural analogs of, uh, of the algebras or the algebras of vector fields. Um, so what I've done so far is I've actually talked about a particular Lie algebroid. Uh, the Lie algebroid I've talked about is what is called the action Lie algebroid, which is just a trivial vector bundle over M. <clears throat> the anchor map, so if the Lie algebra G acts on M by vector fields, then I can just map to vector fields I mean, a point here and a particular Lie algebra element to the vector field at the point at that point. So I have this uh, anchor map, etc. So I've, the, the particular Lie algebra that I've been talking about is, is this particular Lie, uh, sorry, action Lie algebra. The idea is now that we generalize everything to more general Lie algebras. Okay. So that's in short the idea. Um, so here's this picture. Um, now, this involves some more data because sections here, I have a natural way of differentiating them, but over here, I actually need a connection to differentiate them. So you need some more information than just over there. You need an actual connection on this bundle, which I call NABLA. Um, but otherwise, the setup is quite the same. I need a gauge field. Well, the gauge field no longer takes values in the Lie algebra, but it should take values in, well, in the pullback of this bundle Q. <clears throat> uh, and then I set my connection, just differentiates sections of, of my bundle Q. So again, I'm not gonna keep talking this ab abstract language. Uh, I could write down my action in terms of these abstract connections, etc. but I'm gonna introduce a particular basis uh, any basis, I just take a basis of sections of Q. I define my connection one forms just by differentiating the basis. Um, and I claim uh, if I do that, then I'm able to gauge my corresponding model provided G and B are not, well, not necessarily invariant under the set of vector fields, but actually have the following form. So, uh, so this is the wedge and this is the symmetric part of product of differential forms. And my vector fields are just the images of my section over here to the, to, to the vector fields over there. Uh, it's not Poisson Lee, no. Well, not yet. <laughs> that was the result which I hope to announce, which we didn't get to. So <laughs> wait till, uh, well, after my talk. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, this is more general than what I had before. Uh, so the actual model looks uh, the same way. So this is the gauged model, but in order to compensate for the fact that G and B are not invariant, I need some extra term in my gauge transformations, and that has this connection one for a minute. So under these transformations, this becomes a, uh, a local invariance, a local invariant. So the, the, this particular variation cancels the, the additional variations over here. Um, so in order to uh, push it through the same program, I want to add a curvature and uh, a Lagrange multiplier, integrate them out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, OK. Um, The pullback connection is here. Sorry, the, the connect, pullback. Oh, so there's two connections. There's a connection on the Lie algebraoid, and there's this uh, gauge field that I use to gauge the symmetry. Yeah. yeah. So the first issue is that uh, these transformations in general don't close. It will impose conditions on, well, in general, omega and A. Uh, and the other thing is that if I were to solve something like f equals zero, if I were to, I mean, if I have to solve that, I, I need to know something about global transformations. So I'd really like to promote this to some kind of model which has a, a groupoid symmetry. Uh, and it's, as far as I know, it's not known how to do that. So um, 
But again, it, it turns out we can uh, learn a lot already just by local considerations. Um, so I actually don't need that to come to my conclusion. But if, if you really want to make use of this model, you really want to promote it to a groupoid action. And, and again, you also really want to make sure that your gauge transformations close. Um, OK, but nevertheless, people try to apply this model and, uh, and derive some kind of dual. Uh, and I always have problems pronouncing this name, this person, Shastizavrakidis, Dazar and Yonke. So they try to apply this procedure to get some analogs of T-duality, but then for this non-isometric gauging. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, it turns out there exists a natural curvature which is the usual Young-Mills curvature, but gets a component from this, um, from this connection on the Lie algebroid. And uh, in addition, you need to, uh, if you then look at the variation of f, it's, it's quite natural that you also want your Lagrange multiplier to have a, a variation that depends on omega. So, Sorry, which which one? Yeah, 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 yeah. And again, these these things are structure functions. They depend on x in general as well. So, um, so it's. I mean, this is <laughs> this is already way more general than I used to uh, my previous setup. Um, now I've given away the problem already. When we I mean, we were very enthusiastic, we thought, okay, we have this whole new way of creating dualities. But then we look, when we looked at the examples in their paper, uh, we observed that all their examples actually were equivalent to just non-abelian t-duality. Uh, and we were sort of, I guess, surprised that they hadn't seen that themselves. But, uh, but that sort of made us suspicious that maybe uh, uh, we were just doing non-abelian t-duality in a complicated way. OK. And that's indeed what happened. <laughs> uh, so it turns out this, uh, to make to have the product of the uh, Lagrange multiplier and f invariant, um, you actually need a condition on uh, on this on the on the on the omega in particular. There's more conditions, but in particular the first. Uh, I mean, you, you basically want this to transform covariantly to cancel the variation over here. You find that that requires that this particular curvature of omega is vanishing. Uh, otherwise, there's no way this action is going to be invariant. Um, but then uh, things turn out to be uh, simplifying a lot, because if this curvature is vanishing, that at least locally it's, it's pure gauge. So there exists some matrix K, so that omega is just at the form K minus 1 dK. And what you can do then is just redefine your fields. So in particular, you can redefine your vector fields by this matrix K. Or if you want, you just choose a different basis of sections of your Lie algebroid. And uh, you have corresponding basis transformations on your gauge field and your uh, Lagrange multiplier. And that's done in such a way that the transformation of V and for V times A uh, is, I mean, the case cancel. So the covariant derivative is just invariant. And if you write the original model in terms of these transform fields, Lo and behold, you just find back the same model, except where f is your usual Young-Mills curvature. And c are, in principle, still functions. So there's an accompanying, uh, well, I mean, there's an accompanying transformation of, of c that comes from the transformation of these. Uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, and with respect to this new basis, v tilde a, your GMB actually invariant. Now it turns out that's not the only condition. So this condition of flatness of omega is not the only condition you need to get the additional term invariant. Once you've established that this is true, then the next step would be that C is actually constant. So you actually go back to the same situation you had before. You just have gauged uh, with respect to the vector fields that form a Lie algebra uh, with I mean, structure constants, not structure functions. Um, I'm going to finish in, be finishing early, but uh, anyway, so apart from the flatness of omega, the additional requirement you find is that your structure 
transform structure fun functions actually have to be constants. So in terms of a theorem, if you want uh, this gauged Lie algebra gauged model to be invariant, you find that the connection of this Lie algebra, uh, sorry, the curvature of this Lie algebra connection is zero, this connection is flat, and you'll actually find that there exists a basis transformation so that you find inside this Lie algebra just an algebra of, uh, just a regular algebra of vector fields, which close into a Lie algebra. And that explains why. Uh, this, these examples that these people worked out are just equivalent to non-abelian t-duality. It's just non-abelian. You just do the t-duality with respect to a different basis and you find, uh, find the dual. So that was sort of disappointing. Uh, and uh, so it was there. Uh, so to explain what's happening in this original model that I wrote down, um, and it's completely natural if you think about this particular model. Um, so I've told you that I have both left and right invariants if this is a killing metric. But if it's not a killing metric, then we can apply our new procedure of non-isometric gauging. Uh, so with respect to the right action. Um, and it turns out if we then do our basis transformation, then the model is just equivalent to, uh, to this model where our vector fields act, uh, act on the left. So it's just isometrically gauging with respect to the left action on which is this invariant. So you've just interchanged the left and right action, but <laughs> uh, so from this point of view, it's really natural what's happening. Okay, so I think, well, not just G go to the inverse, but you, you really act from the other side. Oh, you mean, uh, yeah, okay, so if I, that model I replace G by G inverse, yeah, yeah. Of course. Uh, okay, so these are basically my slides, and I just want to make a few remarks on what we're trying to do now. What's next? Um, so this poses an open problem, not as a result. Um, so it turns out that this is actually not the most general situation. We can actually uh, take more general connections here. We can take connections with torsion. And just to write down the formulas, and I, I wanted to put this in my slides, but uh, my computer crashed last week and tech was not installed properly, so I couldn't do that, so my apologies. <laughs> uh, so we can actually make it slightly more general by requiring that G and B transform under this set of vector fields as follows. So this was a term we had before. Uh, G, and for B it was something similar, but then with the anti-symmetric part. Um, so we can actually add a B term here as well. Phi AB, uh, IV, sorry, BB, with a, a new uh, object Phi, which turns out is related to a torsion in this bundle. And phi A, B, uh, sorry, wedge I, V, B, G. So if you have this more general situation, then you can actually still gauge the model. So again, the transformation of the coordinates is the usual one, but you just need an additional term in the transformation for the gauge fields. So you need this Yang-Mills term Uh, you need the correction by this omega. But since you're in two dimensions, uh, the Hodge star brings this to, it, uh, to, to also a one form. So the additional term you have to add here is a term with the Hodge star of xi. Okay, and it turns out that, uh, uh, sorry. These are all one forms, yeah. Um, and it turns out, you, I mean, this, this also gives you a gauge nonlinear sigma model, but for a, a more general class of GMV. And it turns out that this class includes Poisson Lee. Um, so Poisson Lee, um, 
Brano talked about this basically, but I guess he didn't write down this formula. So Poisson Lee corresponds to, uh, in general, written in terms of a condition on G plus B of the following type. So if this is not invariant, but is of a following particular form, C, A, B, C, tilde, and then, uh, yeah, some, this is not the most convenient way of writing it down, but this is how the way you, you usually see this formula, um, where the C tilde are the structure constants of a dually algebra in such a way that the pair of the original G and G tilde form what's called the Drimfeld double. Um, then you can do Poisson-Lee t-duality, and I claim that this condition is, uh, well, that you can solve, you can find omega and phi in such a way that this condition falls into that scheme. And in fact, there's, this is the whole family of omega and phi, but you can, for instance, choose omega equals minus phi, and, uh, well, look, I didn't write down the expression for uh, omega and phi for this, that solves this particular case, but you, you can do this. So, um, and it's, it's sort of non-trivial. It's, I mean, it's, it's the other non-trivial fact is that actually those, uh, those gauge symmetries close for Poisson Lee. So the infinitesimal gauge symmetries close, and it's in general very hard to find non-trivial solutions to uh, omega and phi for which the infinitesimal algebra closes. Um, uh, well, not in, well, this is, I mean, non-abelian t well, it's a particular case of this, right? We don't know it for non-abelian, we don't know, in, we don't know it for the case where there exist spectator fields. We don't know that. So if, if you have a Drimfeld double over a base, then, so the global structure is still an open question, but. If I, if we had finished our calculation. <laughs> so there's a lot going on here that seems to be um, too special for just being incidental. <laughs> So the fact that, well, the fact that you can incorporate this in terms of these equations is not so surprising. Uh, basically, you can find phi and, and omega so that you can do this for any variation. But the fact that these infinitesimal transformations close for Poisson Lee is quite non-trivial. Uh, we can also find a curvature term which uh, varies in the right way, but the gauge model with the curvature term doesn't seem to be equivalent to the original model. So we might still be doing something wrong, but so I'm open, putting this in an open question. If we could do this, we would have the first derivation of Poisson Lee through a gauge sigma model. Uh, we think it's, well, my hope is that it is indeed possible, but we haven't completed the calculation yet, so I can't put this as a, as a theorem, but uh, there's too many things going on which, uh, which seem to be too special for it not to work in the end. So, uh, so I guess that's my last conclusion. Thank you. That's correct. Yeah. So you might think that you could, well. So if it works for Poisson Lee, my guess would be that if you do it for non-constant structures, uh, for, for structure functions, that we can do a similar thing by going to a particular basis in which everything reduces to constants. But, yeah.